Well, I'm very happy to be here sharing with you guys this morning. Uh, when people hear that we spend years serving in Israel, sharing the gospel with Jewish people, they usually make the automatic assumption that I'm Jewish, especially because of the beard, right? <laughs> I usually like to make it clear, though, I don't grow a beard because I'm Jewish. I'm not. I'm a Gentile. I'm a southern boy from South Carolina, even though I don't sound like it. I'm not growing a beard trying to look Jewish. I grew a beard for one simple reason. I don't like to shave. <laughs> so. And one good thing about sharing and teaching at a new place is, you guys have never heard that joke before, so I can tell you. Whenever I tell that joke, my kids are like, oh my goodness, another time. But uh, it's uh, something that's been on my heart that God's burdened me since the time when I was a teenager is the, the importance and the necessity of reaching out to people with the gospel, evangelism. It's not something that comes naturally to me. I'm by nature an introvert and kind of timid and afraid of going after people, but God just put a burden on my heart, the importance of this. And for, for our family, it's been a privilege to be able to be part of this church here, Sheridan Hills, that has such a passion for seeing the gospel taken to people here in South Florida and around the world. It's, uh, it's amazing. This summer has been kind of a summer of mission, right? Not necessarily missions, right, with the S. Missions is when you're thinking going overseas, going somewhere and doing things. We've done that, right? We've had two teams that went out this, this summer. We had the team that went to Europe to work with the, the TCK, the Third Culture Kids, and uh, support the work that the families are doing, taking the gospel to people around the world. And by the way, just so you know, that's a hugely important thing. Our family also, has also experienced this, having these times of encouragement and refreshment and having other people pour into our children. It's immensely uh, encouraging and useful in ministry. So it's an important thing. We also had the, the PNL, Project Northern Lights team, that went sharing the gospel taking tracts in uh, New Testaments, gospel material, giving them to North Africans who may have never heard the gospel before. Having the gospel go into an area where it's hard to penetrate. It's a huge, huge ministry. But in addition to that, that's missions. But as we have here, right, the four core values, one is mission, which also encompasses taking the gospel to this area as well. And I was thinking back over the sermons for the past uh, month and a half, we've been reminded about this a lot. Last week, if you were here, we had Pastor Jason Hill. He preached from John chapter 4. He was talking about making the most of divine appointments, looking at Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, how we also can use encounters we have to share the gospel with people. Before that, Pastor Andrew talked to us about famous last words, Jesus' last words in Acts chapter 1, where he said, you will be my witnesses. Before we had the sermon on Luke 18, let the children come, and how important it is to have the gospel being taken to the children in our own church, in our community. TJ reminded us a few weeks ago about considering the big picture, about how choosing the gospel is the most important thing for us in our lives as we're looking ahead. Before that, Pastor Andrew had a, a message, Christ's mission, our mission, that what Jesus was called to, bringing the good news, the truth, is also what we are called to. And then before that, as we were sending the first of the teams out, we had a sermon on they go, we go in prayer about how essential prayer is in evangelistic efforts. And so we've had this, this string of sermons that are just grinding this point in and just bringing it home. And today, you're going to get another one. <laughs> and you, you say, why? Come on, Stephen, why? I mean, we, we've had so much about this this summer. Why focus so much time on this? But of course you know why, right? We know why. We focus so much time on this because this is important. Unbelievers, those who are lost, they need the gospel. They need the gospel. And for us as a believer, this is something we have to keep at the forefront of our minds. And so today we're going to, uh, we're going to look in Romans chapter 10, Romans 10, 13 to 15. My wife makes fun of me sometimes. And she says I teach too much from the book of Romans. She says every time you want to teach, every time you want to quote something, it's from the book of Romans. She says you know there are other books in the Bible, right? I say, yeah, but ah, Romans is just so good. You know, I have a hard time getting away from it. In Romans 10, verses 13 and 15 have been verses that have just weighed on my heart for, for decades. And we're going to read it, and then we're going to talk through it a little bit. So, Romans 10, 13 to 15 says this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And, and how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are, they pre how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
So all of us, we have a, a journey that we walk through before coming to faith, right? Some of us, we grow up in a church, we grow up in Christian families, and it's kind of a short journey. We become believers early on. For others of us, it's a long journey that goes through ups and downs and twists and turns. Every one of us has a journey. But here, Paul is talking about the general idea, the general journey, the things that happen before somebody comes to faith. And he actually walks it through backwards, right? In the passage, he walks it through backwards because he starts with the last moment. He starts with everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's salvation, right? He backs it up, but how can they call if they've not believed? How can they believe if they haven't heard? How can they hear if it's not preached? And how can they preach unless they're sent? Right, so he works it backwards, but we see here the progression. There are five things we see. We see that people are sent. People are sent out. They preach the gospel. Unbelievers hear. They believe. And then they call on the Lord to be saved. And what's interesting, by the way, when it says here preach, it's not talking about like standing up here in front of a couple hundred people and preaching a sermon. That's not what it means. It just means to proclaim, to say to share the gospel. And so here are the five things we see that lead up to the point of where somebody comes to faith in Jesus. Now, what's interesting, if you look at those, those last three, that's in the hands of the unbeliever. That's between them and God. We as believers in Jesus, no matter how much we would like to, we cannot make people call on the name of the Lord. We can't. No matter how much we've tried maybe in the past, you can't force somebody to believe. It's just not within our power. In all honesty, you can't actually force people to hear your message either because sometimes they'll just shut you down or they can just walk away. And so these last three things, the hearing, the believing, and the calling on the Lord, those are those things that are between the unbeliever and God. But the first two, the first two, the sending and the preaching, those are our responsibility. Those are the things that God has called us as his followers that this is what we have to do. And there's something that Paul says here that seems a bit strange because it's so obvious. In uh, verse 14, he says, how are they to hear without someone preaching? And you say, well, duh, right, obviously. You can't hear something unless somebody's making a noise, right? A person can't hear a message unless somebody else is speaking, right? Why would Paul bother to say this? It's, it's obvious. It's right in our face. Why would he make a point of drawing that out in there? You see, think about it for a minute. If God wanted to, if he wanted to, he could shout from heaven. He could shout from heaven and preach the gospel to everybody on earth, right? We believe in an all-powerful God. If this was what he wanted to, he could do that. Everybody would hear, boom, like that. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He can, but he doesn't. This verse shows us that people can only believe if they hear the gospel from a believer. People can only believe in Jesus if they hear the gospel from another believer. It could be in different ways. It could be from a conversation. It could be from a tract or a booklet given. Maybe people are printing Bibles and handing them out or things distributed like what was happening in uh, the P&L ministry. But it has to be some kind of interaction. He says, how are they to hear without somebody preaching? You cannot believe, people cannot believe unless they hear the gospel from another believer. We actually have two examples of this in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, we have Paul. Acts chapter 9, Paul, you guys probably know the story. Paul was Saul persecuting the church, persecuting those who believed, on his way to Damascus to continue persecuting believers. And what happens? Suddenly a light from heaven, a voice, and God is speaking to him. God is speaking to Saul right there on the road to Damascus. And what does he say to him? Does he, pre does he preach, Saul, repent and believe in the name of Jesus right now for the forgiveness of sins? No. God speaks from heaven to Saul and says, go into the city. Somebody's going to come and tell you what to do. And then separately, God appears to a believer in Damascus named Ananias and gives him instructions to go find this guy Paul, find this guy Saul, and talk to him. Ananias was like, whoa, God, hold on, wait a minute, I've heard of this guy. And God's like, no, go, you need to go. 
And so Ananias goes, and Paul comes to faith. But tell me, isn't this very complicated? I mean, Paul, right there, God had Saul right there on the road. Why did he appear to him, send him to the city, appear to Ananias separately, and bring the both of them together? Why didn't God just take the shortcut? Why didn't God just directly tell the message to Saul? It seems obvious. It seems easier, right? We have, in the next chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, a very similar occurrence with Cornelius. You guys remember the story of Cornelius? He was a Roman centurion who followed after God. God appears to him in a vision and tells him to send to this city for Peter. And separately, God appears to Peter to show him that, yes, even Gentiles can be accepted by God. And then Peter is called. He goes to Cornelius and his family. He shares the gospel, and they start to believe. But again, why so convoluted? God had a direct line to Cornelius. He was already talking to him. Why didn't he just share the message? Have you ever thought why God doesn't just take us up to heaven as soon as we believe? He could, right? We start to believe, boom, you're gone. You avoid so much suffering and hardship in life. You don't have to go through pain and difficulties and hard times. You start to believe and then boom, you're in heaven. Everything's great. He has left us here to be his mouth on earth. He's left us as believers to be his messengers, both with, with the Paul, with Saul, and Cornelius. God had a direct line. He was talking right to them, but instead of sharing the message, he pointed them to a believer. He said, go to these people. They will tell you the truth. And that is what's happened. God has left us here on earth to share the gospel. And brothers and sisters, if we don't tell them they won't hear. If we are not sharing the gospel with people, they're not going to hear. If we don't share, if we don't share, who will? Who's going to do it? Are the atheists going to do it? Are the Muslims or the Hindus or the Jewish people, the secularists? If we don't share the gospel, who will? It's our responsibility. This is what God has left us here on earth for, to share the gospel with our friends, with our family, with coworkers, with strangers even. This is one of the re- things that we were born again for. You ever heard somebody say, I was born for this, right? I was born for this. You were born for this. You were born again for this because God has left this task for us. But you may be thinking to yourself, oh, Stephen, come on. What are you talking about? You were here. You were there. Some big guy. What can what kind of person do, you know? I'm not a big guy, but, you know, some people get the wrong idea sometimes. What difference can I make? What difference can one person make? We often think of evangelism as these grand things, famous people preaching to large crowds, you know, a preacher in a church or missionaries overseas doing their thing, Billy Graham in front of thousands and thousands of people. This is what we think about a lot of times as evangelism. But what real difference can a normal person make? I want to look in the book of Acts to give you three examples of an individual that God used in amazing ways. All right, we're going to talk about the importance of one. The importance of one. So there's three people. The first we're going to look at is Stephen. Stephen in Acts 7, the guy I was named after. Right? I like Stephen. I think Stephen's a, a, a great a great story of something going on. Stephen was not an apostle. He was not one of the, the, the leaders, the teachers, the preachers. Stephen was called to be one of the deacons. But at that time, it wasn't uh, deacons like we have today sometimes, deacons who basically run the church. The deacons in the book of Acts were basically table servants. They were there to serve. He was just a normal guy, serving food to people, sharing the message, preaching God's word. And God was working through him. God was using him. And then he was dead. Just like that. He comes into the story, you think, wow, this guy's going to, I mean, it says many times, he's full of spirit, he's full of power, and like that, he's gone, dead. And we think to ourselves, what's going on here? I mean, God just took him out, just like that. What a waste, we would think. What a waste. This guy could have done so much for the Lord, and he's gone. I often make a joke about Stephen, that he's the guy who got himself killed because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Hopefully it doesn't happen to me, but you know. <laughs> he got himself killed because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. If you remember the story, he was, uh, some, people got upset with him as he started going into this history 
of the, the nation of Israel, what God, they had done, what God had done for them. And he comes to the point of talking about Jesus, and they get upset with him. He looks up into heaven, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. An amazing thing. He sees it. But he didn't have to tell them, right? He didn't have to tell them. He just said, wow, God, it's an amazing vision. Thank you. But he told them. <laughs> and they were furious. He said they were yelling. They were stopping up their ears, chasing at him to kill him. Because he said that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He got himself killed because he didn't keep his mouth shut. But there's a very interesting verse there that most people miss. They don't see the connection. In Acts chapter 7, verse 58, it says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. It's talking about Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Have you ever seen that before? Saul was there. Acts chapter 9 is where we see this, the, the, the occurrence of Paul coming to faith, Saul coming to faith. But Acts chapter 7 is where we see that Saul was there and heard what Stephen had to say. He heard the truth from Stephen. Maybe it was the first time even he had ever heard this. And so we can say, wow, Steve, it was such a waste with Stephen. You know, he was gone so soon. But look what God did. God used his boldness. God used his directness. God used his openness to open his mouth to make a huge impact by the fact that Saul heard the truth. And you know, Stephen, he didn't know, he didn't know that his words would change the world. He was just being faithful. He was not thinking, oh, I'm going to share, this guy Saul's going to hear, he's going to come to faith, he's going to go preach the gospel everywhere. No, he was just being faithful. And God used his words to change the world. Another example is Ananias. In Acts chapter 9, we talked about him already. Right? This is a guy that uh, God directed to go to Saul. But who was this guy, really? We don't know anything about him. All, all we see is he's there for that little section in Acts chapter 9, and that's it. His name is not mentioned again. He's not talked about. He was just the man at the moment that God was using to bring and share the truth with Saul. God used him to share with Saul, and Saul came to faith. Ananias, he didn't know that his obedience, he didn't know his obedience would change the world. He was actually worried he was going to be killed. That was his answer to God. God, I've heard about this guy. He's going around everywhere killing people. He didn't know his obedience would be used to change the world. He was just being faithful. Just being faithful. There's another uh, character in the book of Acts, Barnabas. Barnabas we've heard of. We usually think of Barnabas as Paul's sidekick. You know, it's like, you know, superheroes have a sidekick. You know, there's Paul and there's Barnabas on the side. Batman, Robin, Paul, Barnabas. That's how we think of it. But Barnabas is actually in the story in the book of Acts quite a bit more. And I think he's one of the most amazing stories, one of the most amazing people in the book of Acts. Did you know that his name is not Barnabas? Was not Barnabas? In Acts chapter 4, towards the end, you say that his name was Joseph. His name was Joseph. But they called him Barnabas. Son of encouragement. The apostles, right, the ones who had been with Jesus, who had walked and talked and spent years from learning from him, called him Barnabas, son of encouragement, Mr. Encouragement. Can you imagine, you know, these guys, these, these mighty men of God walked around saying, Mr. Encouragement. And everybody started calling him that. Everybody called him, hey, Mr. Encouragement. Mr. En this is a big deal. I mean, can you imagine what kind of guy he was encouraging that every, they changed his name? No, forget about Joseph, your son of encouragement. And we, 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 see, we see this happening in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, after Saul came to faith, he was in Damascus, he was sharing, they wanted to kill him, so he, he left. He went down to Jerusalem. And when he came to Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 27, it says this, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So Saul comes to faith and comes down to Jerusalem and nobody wants to come within walking distance of him. They're afraid of him. He was going around killing people. They didn't believe something had changed. And who fixed that situation? Barnabas. Barnabas saw the situation, and Mr. Encouragement said, okay, 
We're going to fix this. He grabs Paul. He takes him on his authority to the apostles and tells them the story. Barnabas took Paul and brought him in to the, the, the larger kind of fellowship, the community of believers there. Can you imagine what might have happened if Barnabas hadn't done that? You know, Paul gets discouraged, gets fed up, gets out of these guys and just goes off some other direction. Who knows? Who knows? But God used Barnabas, even after Paul was already a believer, to encourage him, to build him in his faith, to push him in the right direction. And so it's interesting because after this, Saul starts teaching again. He starts preaching. And again, people want to kill him. If you look through the book of Acts, it's a very common occurrence. I don't know what this guy said or did, but people always wanted to kill him. Right? And so he's preaching the gospel, and they want to kill him. So the brothers take him from Jerusalem. They send him across the water to Tarsus, to his home. And there's a verse. I don't know if you could believe that there's humor in the Bible. I think there's humor in the Bible sometimes. Because the verse after it says they send him away, in Acts 9.31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. (laughs) So this guy, before he was a believer, the church didn't have peace because he was persecuting them. After he became a believer, the church didn't have peace because he wouldn't keep quiet and everybody was furious because he was preaching so much. They sent him away, and it's like it's a collective sigh. (sighs) Okay. Peace. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know if it's actually meant to be funny. For me, I find it a bit humorous. But uh, God, was this, God was working through him in this way. But they sent him away to Tarsus. And he actually is not in the story in the book of Acts until chapter 11. Because in chapter 11, something happens. There are those who start to believe in Antioch. And Acts 11, 22 through 25 says, The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas. To Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. So he sent to Antioch. God's using him in great ways. People are coming to faith, people are encouraged, people are built up. Everything's going wonderful, and then what does he do? He takes off. He leaves. Why would he leave? He has a great ministry going on here. I mean, he's not going next door. He's planning to go to Tarsus. Tarsus is 120 miles away. And this is not, you know, driving 70, 80 miles an hour on the interstate. You know, he was maybe walking, maybe he had some kind of transportation. This is a couple days trip, one way. And he takes off to do what? Look at what it says. To look for Saul. He didn't even know where he was. He didn't even, maybe he didn't even know if he would be there. But he goes to look for him. Why would he do this? Why? We actually don't know what was happening with Saul during this time. We know that years have actually passed in the story in the book of Acts. Maybe four to five years have gone by since he was sent from Jerusalem to Tarsus. And he's still there in Tarsus, his hometown where he was sent. Maybe he's kind of given up on sharing. Maybe he hasn't given up on sharing. We don't know. But Barnabas sees an opportunity for God to use Saul's gift, and he rushes off to get him. He rushes off to get him. Imagine how the story in the book of Acts would have been different if Barnabas hadn't had this on the top of his mind. If God hadn't used this one individual, which most people forget about, to go and bring Saul back into the community again. So Barnabas... He didn't know how his encouragement would change the world. He was just being faithful. He was just being faithful. But there's one more person I want to look at who's not in the book of Acts. But what about the person who shared the gospel with you? What about the person who shared the gospel with you? How important was that person? Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a coworker. Maybe it was a parent or another family member. Maybe it was a pastor. But how important is that person in your life? What would your life be like without them? If they had not stepped up to share the truth of the gospel with you, how would your life be different? How important is that one person? How important was their faithfulness in stepping out to do what God has said and share the truth of the gospel? You see, we think, what difference can I make? I don't know. I don't know what difference you can make. I don't know what difference any of us can make. But it's God who works through us when we are faithful to take his message to people around us. And he changes the world through that. 
So it's not about us, what we can and what we can't do. It's about being faithful to what God has called us to do and watching in amazement as he does amazing things. So I wanted to circle back a little bit. Because remember, we talked about the, the steps, the five steps, somebody coming to faith, journey to faith. The preaching, I kind of hammered a bit here, but there's one before that. Because it says, how can they preach unless they are sent? How are they to preach unless they are sent? And what does it mean to be sent? What does it mean to be sent? Normally we think of that like the idea of sending out missionaries, you send out evangelists, you send out pastors, or uh, like a week or two ago we sent TJ out to study. To be, is this what it means by sending? Official kind of big time sending people out? Or is there something else to it? We often think of evangelism as a solitary effort. So one, one person kind of deal. And this is true, in part this is true, right? It, whether it's an evangelist who's going out on the streets, going out to talk to people on their own, whether it's a missionary going off into a lonely places by themselves to do whatever God's called them to, or maybe it's just one of us, an individual, sharing with a coworker or a neighbor, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's kind of a solitary, a lonely thing going on. But there's a bigger issue because evangelism also has a community aspect to it. There's a community aspect to evangelism. The first thing I think of when I think of the community aspect to evangelism is encouraging one another. Barnabas, right? He was encouraging people around him, encouraging Paul. We also should be doing the same thing. This is not directly evangelism. This is not actually getting out there and sharing with people. But evangelism is difficult. It's difficult to work up the mm, to be able to share with people, to face that rejection, to face that difficult times. And when we come together as a body of believers and we encourage one another towards this, we encourage one another to continue in this, it's not directly doing evangelism, but it's giving us all the ability and the, the, the inner gumption to be able to go and to share. Not just in encouraging, but also praying for boldness. It's interesting, in the book of Acts, Paul, it says seven times something about Paul speaking boldly. And this is what we think about Paul usually, just, you know, declaring, speaking boldly. But in the end of the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, he asked them to pray for him that he would speak boldly. Now, normally when you ask somebody to pray for something for you, it's not something that comes easy for you, right? If it's easy for you to, to get up in front of people and speak, you don't, it's no big deal. People don't need to pray. It's when you're shaking and trembling, you're like, pray for me, please, I need help, right? So maybe... Paul was asking him to pray for him to speak boldly because it wasn't something that came naturally to him. Maybe it's something that God was working through him even though it wasn't his natural ability. Maybe it's not your natural ability either, but this is one thing where there's a community aspect, is that we pray for each other, that we would, each one of us, have boldness to go and to share the gospel, but also to pray, <clears throat> to pray for those that we're sharing with to pray for those who we share the gospel with, that God would be preparing their hearts, that God would keep working on their hearts after they hear the gospel message. This is something we do not just by ourselves, we should be doing together as a body. Another community aspect to evangelism is equipping one another. Some people have more experience in going out and speaking boldly. Some people have more experience in personal, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Some people have more experience in answering hard questions and doing apologetics and these kinds of things. We can work together in doing evangelism by helping to equip one another, sharing the knowledge that we have, sharing the experiences that we've had so that we're better equipped to go out. And what I say is I think that this also, <clears throat> sorry, this also is sending. This is not the, the formal kind of sending, standing up front and sending somebody out, but this is the church, all of us, in, all of us collectively sending each other out. We're working together as a body to send every one of us out into the community to share the truth. Evangelism is not just for, quote unquote, professionals. It's something that all of us are called to, every single one of us. Doesn't matter what your job, doesn't matter what your level of uh, uh, education, doesn't matter any of this, doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. God has called all of us to share the truth of who he is. So I'm the kind of person, I'm very much into practical stuff. You know, so even if I'm preaching a sermon, I'm thinking, okay, practically, down to earth, what does this mean? Forget the theory, Stephen. So I pulled together five action steps, five things as we talked about this that we should be going forward with as we're talking about evangelism. 
The first one is pray, 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 and pray. Right? Pray as an individual. Pray as a family. Pray in your growth groups. Pray in your community groups. Any evangelistic effort has to start, have in the middle, all the way to the end, prayer. It's the most important thing. You have to be asking God, ask God to give you opportunities to share the gospel. How often do you pray for that? How often do you pray, God, give me a chance today to share the gospel with somebody? This is an important thing to pray. It's not just that, to remind God about it, because he's not forgetting. Oftentimes it's just to remind ourselves about it, to be looking for these kind of opportunities. Ask God to prepare people's hearts. Ask God to prepare people's hearts. You have no idea what's going on in people's hearts. God may be working with somebody intensely, and he brings you to them at just the right moment to share with them. Ask, ask boldly for God to bring them to the point of responding to the gospel. You never know. Maybe it's the first time you're sharing with them. Maybe it's the first time they've heard the gospel. Maybe it's the hundredth time. Maybe they're, they're just close to believing. Maybe they're this far away. But it doesn't matter. Ask God to be working on their hearts. And it doesn't have to be strangers. <clears throat> By the way, don't misunderstand me. I'm not getting up here saying, hey, let's all go out on the streets and we'll start preaching and, and handing out tracts. If you want to, I love that kind of stuff. You can come with me. But it doesn't have to be that. All right? It doesn't have to be that. There are people around you in your family, in your circle of friends, co-workers, neighbors, who aren't believers in Jesus. We have to be praying for them, first of all, that God will be working in their hearts. Secondly, I would say prepare. Prepare. Maybe you say, I don't know how to share the gospel. Or maybe, I don't know how to direct a conversation towards spiritual issues. That's okay. If you don't know, it's okay. Prepare. Learn how to do it. Talk to others who have experience. <clears throat> Talk to people who, who've, who've done evangelism before. Talk to people who've gone through issues like this. If somebody you're sharing with has a specific issue they bring up, find someone in the church who's been through that kind of situation, who knows the answer to it, right? Talk to people. The, the, the church, is, we as a church, are planning to do also evangelism training in the future. When you hear about something like that, go for it. Run after it. Be prepared. Know how to share your faith with people. Also in the back, I don't know if you saw it earlier, we have a table, it's on my right, on your left, we have a table set up with different books there, some of them books that you can purchase and give to people who aren't believers, Others that are books for how to, to prepare yourself, training and how to do evangelism. But also we have tracts there. You guys know what tracts are? Little paper things, two, three pages, very small, very short. They, we have ones that are in different directions, different angles that you can take and give to people. Maybe give it to them to start a conversation, to open a conversation. Or maybe have it to give to somebody once the conversation is started. There's many different ways you can go about it. But I say prepare, get ready. Get yourself with the right tools, with the right knowledge, so that you can effectively share the gospel with people. The church has purchased these tracks in the back and made them available for you guys to take so that you can effectively share the gospel with the people around you and put something in their hands they can read afterwards. So after you've prayed, after you've prepared, plan. I know it's all P's. I, I couldn't help myself. It just it fits so well. Plan. Get ready. Think about how to create opportunities to share with unbelievers. You don't just have to wait for something to come up. You can create opportunities. Invite people over for a meal. If you don't like to have them in your house, go to a restaurant, whatever. But have a meal together. Sit and eat together. Show interest in what they love to do. Maybe they love to do something that you can't stand. Doesn't matter, go do it with them. Go play golf or go to a game, sports game or whatever it is that they enjoy doing. Spend time with them. Get to know them. And in that relationship, you'll find opportunities to share the gospel. And then the big one, preach. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We have to share the message of the gospel with people. It has to come from our mouths. Yes, we have to live it out. But also the message has to be preached. We have to proclaim it. We have to share in words the truth of people. Share it. If we don't, they will never hear. If we don't share, they will never hear. And then one last, one last thing, persevere. I think this is an important step that many people forget about. Most of the time, 
and I mean most of the time, like 99.999% of the time, people aren't going to fall on their knees and repent the first time you share the gospel with them. It's not going to happen most of the time. God does do things like that, but most of the time you're going to share with somebody and there will be a mixed response. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's easy to get discouraged, you know, especially if somebody gets really pushes back hard and gets angry or upset with you. It's easy to get discouraged and just give up. Don't give up. Persevere. There's one thing that I, when I learned, when I realized this, it changed evangelism for me. When I realized that sharing the gospel is success, it changed. It changed. I always thought that I've succeeded if this person comes to faith. But that's not true. You cannot bring somebody to faith in Jesus. You can't. And if you do, something's very wrong. It's only God that can do this work in people's lives. We are called to share the message. If you have done that, you have succeeded. You have done what God has called you to do. And so once the, you've, once the message goes out from you, you've shared with them, you've succeeded. Even if they respond negatively, even if they respond harshly, you've done what God has called you to do. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Keep persevering. Keep looking for opportunities to share with the person. I'm not talking about badgering them, you know, slapping them every time you see them with the gospel, but look for opportunities in the future. Look for new, new angles, new ways to come about it, new, new things to talk about together. Live the truth. After you've shared with them, live the truth that you've shared with them. Many times this is something that, that, that turns people's hearts and minds, is when they hear the word and then they see the truth lived out in your lives. And most importantly, trust God for the results. Trust God. As you persevere, as you continue, trust God because he is the one who's going to bring the change in people's lives. So I'm going to be back there after the service at the table. If you want to come and talk, I can explain some of the tracks to you. We can talk about some of the books. If you have questions, ideas, you can talk to me. You can talk to Pastor Andrew, Pastor Lucas, other leaders in the church. But just if you remember anything from this sermon and this time, Remember, how will they hear without a preacher? How will the lost, around, the lost people around us ever come to know the Lord if we as believers don't open our mouths and share? Let's pray.